Everyone, next we have Pulsar Helium Inc. It trades on the OTCQB under the symbol PSRHF and on the TSXV under the symbol PLSR. And its portfolio consists of the Topaz Helium Project in Minnesota and the Two New Helium Project in Greenland. Pulsar is the first mover in both locations with primary helium occurrences not associated with the production of hydrocarbons identified at each. Please welcome its president and CEO, Thomas. James, nice to see you again. Very nice to see you as well, Anna. Thanks for having me. All right, we're going to kick it off with a video. Let's roll it. We've got a major update for a historically high concentrated helium deposit. Helium is one of the most sought after elements on the planet. Scientists got the big readings early this morning. The mine is located just outside Babbitt. It could be one of the richest helium reservoirs in the world. Biggest such discovery in North America. Helium is the undervalued and the understated commodity that nobody knows that we rely on. More or less all electronic items rely upon helium. For Pulsar, we go off and we find new occurrences of helium. And so our Topaz project in Minnesota that has been drilled and flowed 13.8% helium, it's important for multiple reasons. To be able to provide the market with the opportunity to acquire helium that is not uh, linked to the production of hydrocarbons, to give companies the choice to go for that greener supply source. In addition to the big ones, tech, med tech, fiber optics and aerospace, Helium is used in a variety of other areas and industries, including quantum computing, welding and fabrication, technical diving, fusion energy and the associated R&D, renewables, leak detection, uh, automotive and airships. So the application and usage of helium is wide ranging. Our Topaz project here in Minnesota in the USA is incredibly well located, which is crucial as we position ourselves as one of the major players in North America in the months and years to come. Okay, I think uh, there we are. Nice to see you, everybody. So uh, thanks very much for your time today, uh, that introductory video there, and so now on to the presentation. Um, so it's been a very busy time for the company. Um, we'll click through that, and then you will have a chance to read it. And uh, we're going to be focusing on our Topaz project today, uh, which is in Minnesota, as uh, was the highlight in that video there. Um, so really, we have uh, completed a, a recent work, work program, which is uh, drilling the appraisal well, uh, referred to as the jet stream number one well, and uh, we're receiving helium contents up to 14.5%. So just reconfirming that high-grade nature of it, which is extremely pleasing. Um, we then, um, you know, we're the first mover in Minnesota as well, and we do have another project in, uh, in Greenland but uh, called Tunu, uh, but sadly not enough time to go through that one today. So really, just to put it in perspective, and this is looking at uh, uh, you know the, the best wells in each state uh, in terms of the helium content, and it's really nice that uh, Minnesota it is a brand new jurisdiction for helium. Uh, as I say, we're the only uh, uh, company there at the moment exploring for helium, and there it is, the, the highest recorded helium concentration in North America, which is just a, a tremendous start, and for such a uh, for such a, a new location, uh, extremely pleasing to see. Um, so here we have a corporate structure. So this is from uh, when the share data from Friday of last week, where we closed at 99 cents, uh, giving us a market capitalization of just over 100 million Canadian dollars. Um, worth mentioning that we listed on the uh, TSXV, that's our primary listing uh, in August of last year via IPO. Uh, and up to that moment in time, I believe that we were the only IPO out of any uh, sector on the TSXV at that moment in time. So very pleased with that. And really with our share price that we've seen since uh, uh, listing, uh, we came in at 30 cents and really it, it then went up significantly when we completed drilling that jet stream well in at the end of February. Uh, we've uh, This year we've been admitted onto the OTCQB and we also have the DTC eligibility for all those who are residents of the United States. Um, in terms of shareholder base, uh, so, worth mentioning that directors, management, uh, insiders, uh, we hold a considerable position in the company. So, we have roughly about 60% uh, uh, of the stock. So, it's very tightly held. Um, so, 
Uh, and also out of that, so 40%, 46% of the issued share capital is subject to ESCO uh, arrangements. So with the principals and non-principals, the founders, in other words, uh, we are uh, escrowed up to a total uh, where we're not completely unlocked uh, for three years after listing. So what's that, uh, the beginning of 2027? Uh, just to really give you all an idea of uh, how much we believe in this project. Um, so the public uh, shareholding float, so those ones which you see that are, are really tradable, is about uh, 38% uh, of the issued share cap. Um, in terms of the team, so myself, uh, I've got a, a background in helium that expands about a decade. Uh, so myself and our chairman, Neil Herbert, and our technical manager, Josh Blewett, uh, we uh, started up a company about, uh, what was it, uh, just under 10 years ago now, which is called Helium One, uh, listed in London. Uh, that was the world's first ever dedicated helium exploration company. Uh, since then, we've gone on to, to found and form what is Pulsar, what we're talking about today. And uh, that's on the back of the asset, uh, primarily in Minnesota. And then we also uh, developed that project in Greenland. Um, so really, with 10 years uh, experience in the industry and starting up that first ever helium exploration company, uh, we really do know every walk of life in the industry. We're very well versed in uh, upstream, downstream uh, you know, production facilities, who to do the offtakes with the exploration methodology uh, and everything in between. Uh, Complemented with uh, John Ferrier, uh, who's a non-exec, who's got a, who's used to be the CEO of Gulf Keystone Petroleum, so uh, petroleum production in Iraq. And then we have down here is notable as well as a Brice Lorraine, who represents our largest shareholder. Um, I touched here, so with our technical manager, Josh Blewett and co-founder. Uh, and then also noteworthy, we've got uh, Michael Sturdy, who's our general manager of operations. So for those of you in Minnesota, uh, you'll certainly be seeing a lot of Michael running around. And really we get into it. The title of this slide says it all. So helium, its uses. It's not about party balloons. Uh, party balloons is probably about 3% of market share. Uh, everything else is biased towards the, the tech industry. Uh, so for uh, semiconductors, computer chips, and therefore uh, artificial intelligence, uh, there's an awful boom uh, in that sector. And in order to make the semiconductors, you need liquid helium. Uh, MRI scanners, in order for the magnet to superconduct, you need liquid helium. Uh, for spacecraft launch to maintain pressure in the fuel tank, you need helium. Uh, fiber optic cable manufacturing, you need helium, and so on and so forth. So really, it's all tech, and uh, it's seen to be uh, a growing industry. But supply is tight, and so what that's really done is being reflected in the uh, in the value of helium. Uh, it's it's worth more than a hundred times the price of natural gas, and uh, there's there's two different products of uh, helium that you can do. So helium in liquid form, which is its purest and uh, most valuable product and then uh, in gas form as well. And so really that's for different applications. Um, but uh, we can see that with recent pricing points, uh, the unit of measurement is 1,000 cubic feet. So for gas, we're seeing uh, helium recent contract price of $625 per 1,000 cubic feet, and for liquid helium in excess of $1,000. In terms of uh, supply, uh, where does it come from? So highlighted on this map in green are the major producing countries. And uh, uh, you can see here a couple of things. So firstly, Russia, uh, North America is not going to be seeing any uh, Russian supply uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, and the USA, also most importantly, is uh, productions in decline. So USA is still holding on to the position as the number one producer, just. But uh, the gas fields where the helium is being produced as a byproduct from natural gas, uh, the outputs are less. Uh, also, the U.S. Federal Helium Reserve, which is, uh, you know, well, as the name suggests, uh, a government uh, standalone repository of helium, that's just been privatized, and uh, there is not much gas left there either. Uh, and that really has been the, the flywheel in the system. So most helium produced as a byproduct of natural gas, but having that standalone Federal Helium Reserve really brought balance to supply. It was the flywheel in the system, and that's effectively, well, gone now. Uh, so it's becoming more volatile uh, in terms of supply. And that's really created an opportunity for Qatar. So Qatar, with its natural gas production, is now uh, ramping up production of helium and is set to become the world's number one producer of helium, uh, which is fine. But getting it across to North America is somewhat problematic because of the shipping distance. Um, so helium is something that doesn't like to be transported. 
um, it, uh, it's, uh, well, as we see with the helium balloon analogy, it likes to leak. So having a uh, domestic supply really is key. Uh, demand is constrained by supply, and it's been like this for about a decade now. So we see here the, the growth. Uh, so this is in billions of cubic feet. So at the moment, we're using about 6 billion cubic feet. It's projected to grow to over 8 by 2030. Uh, but ultimately, uh, it is constrained by that supply. We know that uh, a lot of end users are not getting their full allocation of product. And the other thing is, is that really for most applications, helium is not substitutable for the reasons which I've listed here on the right-hand side, being inert, a liquid at very cold temperatures and so on. So now we're going to focus in on Topaz and uh, the latest results that we've received here. So with that up to 14.5% helium content, to put it into context, uh, anything which has got a, a, in the raw gas a helium concentration of 0.3% or more uh, is deemed to be of economic, uh, you know, potential economic significance. So 14.5% you know, truly is uh, world class. Location, brilliant location. We're in northern Minnesota. Uh, so we can see in the map here just by Lake Superior. And we're right next to some of North America's largest iron ore slash taconite mines. Uh, so this has got an area of uh, rich history, 150 years of resource extraction, uh, and a very highly skilled workforce as well. And also, I think fair to say, a, a very supportive local community. Uh, we've certainly done uh, you know, to, to go around and meet everyone possible and, uh, and also be very transparent to have as many people come to site as well. Um, so we're certainly proud of that and uh, very pleased with the reception that we've received. Uh, infrastructure is great. So we have roads nearby, there's grid power nearby. Um, so really in terms of, you know, looking to the future and should we get to that production point of view, uh, then certainly it's a wonderful location. And for then helium being transport uh, on trucks, so it's in customized 40 foot containers on the back of a truck, uh, it can then, you know, quite simply go off to anywhere in the contiguous United States. So here's the big one. So the appraisal well. So Jetstream, this is what we've just drilled and we've just received the data on. So we put out an announcement last week and a, a follow up on Monday of this week. And uh, really uh, very happy with the results that we've received. I mean, really from a, a hole where we replicated the original discovery. Uh, so the original discovery is about 50 feet away from where we drilled. So the picture there of the rig. Um, and really that hole was made by, by chance, uh, a different company that was exploring for nickel and about 1800 feet, they hit gas under high pressure and that came back with 10 and a half percent helium. So really our objective was to go and twin that hole, drill just nearby to it and see if we can replicate the result. Is it real? And, uh, yes, it's real. So, uh, the proof of concept, you could call it the appraisal well, uh, was a success. Uh, we hit gas that then came up naturally to surface. Uh, without stimulation. Uh, that gas, uh, we achieved a maximum flow rate uh, during our testing of 821,000 cubic feet. And then we were getting helium concentrations in the range of 8.7 to 14.5% helium. Uh, it's worth noting too that uh, we're getting additional analysis coming in from uh, was it three other labs that we're waiting on as well for additional gas content. But really, uh, we are very happy with it because if you, you know, basic metric here, of uh, looking at that flow rate and multiplying it by the concentration of helium, then that really puts it up amongst some of the, the well, right up the top there of some of the best helium wells that have ever been drilled. Um, so for something which is effectively a, a proof of concept well, and quite a shallow one at that, uh, to, to have that is just, you know, wonderful. So uh, it really has given us the, uh, the encouragement we need to, to press on. Uh, in addition to that as well, uh, we've got uh, a pressure reading at the bottom of the hole there, uh, 162 PSI. Uh, what does that mean? That's about sort of what, four or five times the pressure that you might put into a tire, uh, just a, a car tire, just to give you a sort of appreciation for that level of pressure. And what we found was that uh, after it was flowing and then we closed it off uh, so that the gas was not flowing anymore, that pressure built up uh, rather quickly. So it got back to 70% uh, of that uh, original number within the first hour. And what does that mean? That basically means that the, the gas is recharging uh, quite rapidly. So that uh, gives us a level of confidence that this is not just a small pocket of gas, that we're looking at something that's potentially bigger than that, that's for sure. Um, so this is what it looks like. So this is site and this is uh, the drill rig when it was all out there at, uh, in February. 
And what are the implications? So knowledge learned. So uh, we collected other data as well. So I won't go into too much detail with this, but uh, things like optical televiewer, which really gives you an uh, imagery down hole, uh, and then a vertical so seismic profile. And what is confirmed is that the, uh, the, the play type that we have here is a fractured basement play, uh, that the gas is uh, in, held, hosted in fracture systems, uh, and that uh, they, they extend vertically and laterally uh, away from uh, the well itself. Um, we see that uh, there's no evidence of formation water as well, which is great. So, uh, so with that, uh, you know, some other occasions uh, in other places around the world, you can get the gas associated with water flowing up the surface. Uh, that is not the case uh, at our project. Um, and then, of course, the, the helium content being very high. What does that mean? So for the end user, the end user of helium, they, you know, they want a pure product. And that's what would ultimately potentially be produced uh, at this operation. But in terms of high helium content for us, is that means that, you know, you need not so much gas to be discovered for it to be quite significant just because it's so rich in helium. Uh, the other thing too is when it comes to processing of the gas is that you're actually processing less gas uh, because of the helium content so high once again. So that may also have efficiencies there as well uh, in production costs. So now what, what does the future look like moving forward, building on our success? So all the data that we have has been sent off to our resource, uh, independent resource calculator, uh, a group called Sprawl uh, in the US. And uh, they're now crunching all the data. And uh, we are hopeful that sometime next month, we will receive the updated resource calculation uh, for, for Topaz. And then in the meantime, what we're doing is we're looking at, okay, building on the success with additional field activities. Now, as I say, with the hole that we just drilled, it really replicated that original discovery. Uh, now, with the data that we've already acquired, which is this, uh, we're looking at a seismic profile here, a seismic section. What we're seeing is that fracture zone, where that's hosting the, the gas, the helium bearing gas, it, it really seems to be represented by this green section here, which is where you're seeing a, a velocity decrease in seismic waves. And so what we're seeing is that uh, we've just kissed the top of it. It really is uh, a lot of room to go down further. So uh, very much we're looking at deepening uh, the well later this year. So that's something that we can definitely do with the existing well. It's set up so that we can re-enter and go deeper. And then also drilling additional step-out wells also. Uh, the precise location of those will be determined once Sprawl has finished their work and the other interpretation that's going on by other experts. But uh, certainly to build upon that and, you know, going down deeper as well, you know, you'd anticipate uh, that the pressure will increase with depth as well. And that may also have a, a positive ramification on the flow rate too. Um, there's also CO2 present in our well. So uh, we're getting contents of up to 71.3%. Um, so with this, then the, the options are definitely that we could look to sequester the CO2, put it back in the ground. But also at the same time, there's a significant uh, CO2 shortage in the USA. Uh, this has persisted now for about two years. And this does have a, you know, CO2 is something that we use in everyday life, that's for sure. So, you know, a common one that we think about is uh, in, in beverages to make them fizzy. Uh, was it no fizz, no biz? So it's important for the carbonated drinks, uh, for medical, for, for gases there, for, uh, for whilst conducting surgery, and then also breathing gases. Um, possible water treatment. So CO2 is used a lot to uh, reduce the pH level of water and then also for food preservation as well. So significant everyday uses. And really with that, uh, that shortage and uh, the increase in price in CO2, uh, this really has uh, you know, produced a, an opportunity uh, to contribute to any potential project economics as well. So this is being uh, evaluated. Uh, it's also worth noting that uh, Minnesota is an importer of CO2 as well and quite displaced from the US's current sources of CO2 production. So a Topaz project with the, uh, with the real wonderful progress that's been made and the very successful results. Uh, unsurprisingly, we made the media. So it's been really pleasing to see. We've been on Reuters, so we've been on uh, Fox, we've been on CBS and then all the local media. So that's just been fantastic for us. And uh, so look, you know, how, what does the pathway to potential production look like? And this is really where we're focused now. So as I mentioned, we finished the appraisal well, uh, the resource calculation is now, hopefully will be uh, conducted next month or finished next month. We then have that uh, additional drilling and seismic acquisition. 
And then we're going to be looking at a preliminary economic assessment. So we can start for the first time to talk about what do the economic scenarios look like. And then after that should all go well, we get into the engineering, civil works, discussions around offtakes, and then a, a definitive feasibility study and project finance. So the news flow is quite thick and fast. Um, and, uh, and on top of that, something which I, I'm very, you know, very proud of and very happy to see is the state of Minnesota has just, what, about a fortnight ago, uh, implemented its new helium legislation. So it's actually for helium, hydrogen, and CO2 sequestration. But the helium aspect uh, is it's uh, certainly on the back of the work that uh, we at Pulso have conducted. Uh, we've got a very good uh, working relationship with the state there. And uh, just uh, very happy to see that that new legislation went through. And that just gives us the confidence that we need uh, to move forward, uh, to start assessing that production, um, and, uh, and that we know what the rules of engagement are and that the local community will benefit from our, uh, from our presence as well. So uh, very pleasing. Um, and then we've got uh, our contact details. So look, what I might do, Anna, is I might leave it there and then hopefully we have some questions uh, from the floor. Good job. Yes, we do have some questions for you. Uh, you touched on this, but talk a little bit more about uh, if the, the grade increases once the air contaminated samples have been properly understood. Is that going to happen? And um, when will the results be realized? Is that going to happen in July? Uh, with that, so yeah, so with the uh, with the samples that we have uh, that we just received, so the 8.7 to 14.5 percent helium, uh, we do see that there is a little bit of air contamination there. So that's currently being tidied up. What that means is basically it's being slightly diluted with the air that we breathe, and so the anticipation there is you remove that data, and uh, and then you know your, your helium content increases, and then the uh, the other three laboratory analysis are coming soon as well. And how confident are you that Pulsar's expectations will be surpassed regarding size and scale of the reservoir? <laughs> well, certainly, I, I think that's everything that we've seen. It really does look, uh, you know, quite magnificent, to be honest. I mean, we've got, uh, so with the, uh, with, the, uh, with the pressure that we're seeing down in the well, that's extremely encouraging for a volume of gas that's there, that positive flow, obviously the high helium content. But then also we've been, uh, I guess, building up before we drilled this hole, we acquired the seismic data. Uh, we can now really couple that very nicely with the uh, helium bearing zone that's in the drill hole and extrapolate that further across. So I guess our level of confidence that that, uh, that green blob I showed you in the section there, that it actually is uh, something that uh, really appears to be reality. So it, it looks like it's going to be quite laterally extensive. Um, but we're also aware, too, that uh, it, it, it very much looks like a regional play because we know that 100 miles down off to the southwest, that there's uh, a gas occurrence there, and that came with 2% helium. So we're extremely confident that we're onto something fairly big here. Wonderful. And so why is drilling deeper likely to see improved flow rates, and how much of an improvement are you really expecting? Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, I guess it's a, it's, a, it's a bit like uh, when you go diving down in the water, you can only get to such a depth before you get squashed and you implode. So, so like anything with the depths for uh, drilling deeper into the ground, uh, the pressure only increases as you go deeper. As I say, relatively shallow well uh, compared to others in the industry. We went down to 2,200 feet. Uh, we think that uh, with what we see in the seismic data, you know, we could more or less double that, um, certainly with the, the, the data we're seeing from the seismic. Um, so that uh, would undoubtedly have an, a positive impact on pressure and therefore flow. Question from Paul Seaton asking, do you see any Minnesota state legislative mandated regulatory challenges to the new unregulated gas mining industry? Wow, what a question. Um, so, uh, if I understand it correctly, look, I don't see any challenges, to be honest. Uh, I think that uh, uh, what's been put in there, uh, well, certainly with the high level ones that have gone through now, uh, I think quite reasonable. Uh, I think well, now that uh, what is it, they've got a committee working until the, the 15th of January to put forward the, uh, the, the interim um, sort of rules uh, and, until the final ones are, are completed. Uh, we're not privy to those, but certainly with the discussions that have been had to date, and we've certainly been quite open with the data that we have and so on, that I mean, have I got any concerns? No, I don't have any concerns. I haven't seen anything. I think that uh, uh, everyone's being very pragmatic about it and making something that works for both us and the community. So uh, no concerns, put it that way. 
And Eric asks, has the state of Minnesota done anything to help promote your project or have you been receiving pushback from the government? No, the government's been very good. I mean, I think probably the best uh, promotion we could see is, is the passing of this new legislation. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it happened at lightning speed. I mean, just, uh, uh, you know, we, we obviously have engaged with them over uh, sort of since we first arrived uh, in 2019. Um, but, uh, you know, to get it through at this crucial time is great. Um, certainly with uh, local politicians, uh, quite a few have come to site and seen it with their own eyes. Um, and um, no, look, it's... it's uh, it's been a wonderful reception, probably, you know, one of the warmest receptions I think I've experienced in my career. So uh, I think that the transparency from our side and uh, allowing everyone to come and have a look uh, is paying off. Great. Uh, Chris says it looks very promising. So what's your best guess on the timing and size of production volumes being delivered from your site? Oh. You, you probably know I can't answer that question in its entirety, but, it's, uh, but hey, let's give it a go. Um, so look, uh, I think that, uh, you know, should all the planets align and, you know, get the crystal ball out and so on. But uh, look, you know, if it, we execute the work program that I've mentioned, then, you know, probably next year uh, sometime we'd be then that looking at, uh, you know, the, the feasibility study and, you know, should everything there all look, um, you know, fine, then uh, I guess uh, there is potential for, I guess, something happening at the end of next year or the beginning of the following year, um, should everything go just fine. And Diana says 14.5% helium content. How does this rate as compared to industry standards? Also, how large is that deposit? Okay, so compared to industry standards, so 95% or more of the world's helium at the moment is produced as a byproduct of natural gas. So the helium contents are, are very low. Uh, so typically, you'd be looking at sub 1%. Um, and there's uh, there's also uh, a couple of other companies out there which are in the same line of business as us, which is looking for helium without hydrocarbons. And uh, those ones that are, are going into production or have gone into production, they're roughly around that sort of half a percent, 1%. So, uh, you know, we're almost an order of magnitude higher concentration. Uh, in terms of the size of the prize, what's the volume? Uh, then look, you know, the, now it's building the anticipation because we'll have that figure next month. So stay tuned. And uh, Barry wants to know how long before you will need to raise some money? How long until we need to raise money? Well, look, we had, uh, was it, we had uh, with the warrants that we had out from the IPO, we put an accelerator on those and we converted 100% of the warrants. So that was very pleasing. So we got in about $5 million from that. Uh, we also have some other warrants that are out there from a placement that we did earlier uh, that we're then looking to do something with those as well. And then we already have a few million in the treasury as it is for this moment in time. So financially, you know, we're doing well. And Daryl Page wants to know about your preliminary economic assessment. When is that expected to be released? Um, I'm hoping that uh, that we will have probably have that in Q4 of this year. Perfect. Well, Thomas, do you have any closing remarks for our viewers today? Yeah, look, uh, I think it's just, uh, whoops, sorry, as I break something here. Uh, I think it's a very exciting time for the company. I think that, uh, you know, we've uh, since we put out the results, I think we've seen a little bit of volatility in our share price. Uh, I think that that's, uh, you know, for those people who've just joined us on board as shareholders, well done. I mean, it's a, it's a very exciting and good opportunity to get on board. And for those like me who've been uh, holding on to our shares, I think you can see with the news flow that's coming that it's, uh, you know, this is, it's going to be thick and fast and uh, we're off to such a tremendous start. It's just the tip of the iceberg. So happy days. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us back on the conference and we look forward to following you along with your journey. Thanks, Anna. Take care. All right, everyone stay with us. We'll be right back with Cadrenal Therapeutics.